Okay, good day. This is AP Calculus. I am Mr. McCulley. This is the presentation for section 4.4, the fundamental theorem of calculus. And I'm sure you're asking yourself, why does it take half of the year to get to the fundamental theorem of calculus? Um, but that's kind of the way it is. But truly, the fundamental theorem of calculus is a um, amalgamation of both integrals and derivatives. So you might figure it out here as we move along. So let's get to it. Enough of that stuff. Today we're going to evaluate uh, the definite integral using the fundamental theorem of calculus. We're going to understand the mean value theorem for integrals. We're going to find the average value of a function over a closed interval. And then we are also going to understand the use of the second fundamental theorem of calculus and understand the net change theorem. So let's talk about that first one right there the fundamental theorem of calculus if f is a function continuous over some closed interval from a to b and capital f is the antiderivative of f on the closed interval from a to b then the integral from a to b of f of x with respect to dx is capital f of x evaluated from a to b which essentially says plug in uh, b into capital f and subtract it the uh, evaluated value of when you plug in A into F, capital F that is. And so some consequences from that. Uh, the definite integral finds the area of a curve on a closed interval as long as that um, function is above the x-axis. And so you also have to be careful of if that function ever dips below the x-axis. It's not really hard but you have to separate it into two functions and count that as negative um, negative area. As far as application problems go, we want to always uh, visualize the uh, integral as an accumulator, something that is adding up area over an interval. And I can show you some examples of that. And so we also and I've kind of already talked about this definite integral versus area under the curve. So if I want to, let's just, let's talk about the sign, just sign X real quick here. Um, we all know, So if I say F of X equals sign X from uh, pre-calculus, if I go from negative pi over two to positive pi over two, this goes from negative one to positive one and if I said, what is the area between the curve and the x-axis? I'd have to, and I said, well, I'm just going to use the, the definite integral. And I set up an integral from um, uh, negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. The definite integral is going to calculate this as negative area and this as positive area. And so the integral of sine x dx from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2 is going to be 0. But the area under the curve is a little bit different. It's all of this area. You'd have to calculate that one and then calculate that one. And so when you're using a graphing calculator, yes, it will find the value of a definite integral, but it will not evaluate or find the indefinite integrals. So if something says give the indefinite integral of a function, your graphing calculator won't help you there. It will also not take into consideration area under the x-axis. So if you plug, if you think, oh, they give you an area under the curve uh, question, and you think, oh, I'm just going to plug that into my graphing calculator, you really have to be careful because they certainly might make it so that this function might dip below the x-axis. And you have to check that out. It's not that difficult. Just graph any function that you think you're going to do the uh, definite integral on and then check to make sure that it's always above the x-axis and you'll, you'll be okay. The average value theorem for integrals, if f is continuous over the closed interval a to b, then the average value uh, over the uh, closed interval um, from a to b can be found by b or 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b, the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx. So in simpler terms, you guys know how to do average. All right, You add up a total, total set of values divided by the number of those things that are there. And so since we said that you can think of the integral as an accumulator, this portion of the graph adds up all of the area. And this tells you 
the number of values, I guess, is the best way for me to, to visualize it underneath that. And so you find the average of what that function is over that entire curve, especially if it's irregular. Now, the mean value theorem for integrals is says that basically is this, is that if you find that f is continuous over a closed interval, there has to be a number c in the closed interval such that um, the value of the, um, the integral is equal to the, the function value times that difference. Now, really, you could probably write this as, again, 1 over this. So basically, it says that, is that somewhere in this interval, there has to be a value c, a value for x, such that the function value is equal to the average value. And that's going to be my first example, and we'll talk about that here after a slide. The second fundamental theorem of calculus says that if f is continuous on an open interval i containing a, then for every x in that interval, we can, if we take the integral of some function t dt with respect to t, and then take the derivative of that, it is just the function in with terms of x. And that's fairly simple because, again, that a is going to be a constant when you plug it in. The net change theorem, the definite integral or the rate of change of a quantity gives a total uh, change or the net change in that quantity of the interval. So here, this kind of goes to my um, my earlier example that says if you um, if you talk about a function that determines velocity, this if the function that determines velocity is already a derivative because it's distance divided by time. And so if you wanted to find the net change of the velocity equation, you can take the integral and then plug it in for the, the upper bound and the lower bound, and that will find the net change. In the case of a velocity question, that is going to be the total distance traveled. Okay, so let's talk a couple of examples here real quick. It says, find the value of c guaranteed by the mean value theorem for integrals over the given interval. Now, before we talk about that, let's talk about just the graph of this function here for a second. If I plug in 1 and I plug in 3, and that's my closed interval of this particular function here, then when I plug in 1, 1 to the third is 9, and so I get 9 here. And then when I plug in 3, 3 to the third is 27. 9 over 27 is 1 third, so way down here. And we know, just because we graph from pre-calculus, that this grows very rapidly. So this thing tends to curve down and is eventually going to get closer and closer to zero. Now, because this is not a linear curve, you notice that I have very little high values, but I got a bunch of low values. The average value isn't going to be directly in the middle. All right, It's probably going to be somewhere right around here, I think, for the average value for the whole the whole curve. But we can figure out what that is. Now, the question asks us, so let's just say as a for instance that this value here is my average value. Now, that average value there ends up being a function value based on some, and then it turned, looks the way I have it drawn, it looks like it's going to be in the middle. And it's not really in the middle, so just have to just be patient and we'll get to it. So the average value, uh, the mean value theorem for integrals says that there has to be some c, that when I plug in that c, I will get the average value for the function over that curve. So let's do that. Let's find the average value first. So average value is going to be equal to, well, it's the integral from uh, a to b, which in this case is going to be 1 to 3 of the function 9. And I'm going to rewrite it here, x to the negative third, and then dx. And then that way I can apply the simple power rule on it. But I also need out in front that difference. So in this case, it's going to be 3 um, to 1. And so when I do this, uh, my fraction here is going to be a half. And then I can do this integral right here and say that it's going to be 9 times, you know, it'll be x to the negative 3 plus 1 over negative 3 plus 1. And then this whole thing is going to be evaluated from, you know what, let's get rid of that particular uh, negative 3 plus 1. 
and then let's talk about it'll be from a one to three evaluated all right so i'm going to bring this nine out it becomes nine over two and then we get um uh let's see um i plug in three it'll be one over negative two times um three squared minus one over negative two times one squared that works let's see if i can't evaluate this mess here i probably should pull that negative half out and that'll make this a little bit easier to pull that negative two out that'll give me a negative nine over four because i could take a two out of both of those and then two times two it'd be on the bottom and since this is positive and make it negative and then i'll end up with one over um, 9 minus 1 over 1, so it's just 1. So 9 over 4, 1 ninth minus 1 would be negative 8 ninths. I'm not going to spend enough, any time doing fractions with you guys. Negative times negative is positive. 8 over 4 is 2. So the average value for this function is 2, and they want us to find the value of C. Well, that's easy. We've done that. This function here... Um, this we want to know what value of x makes the function equal to 2 we've done that for for forever x to the third equaling to 2 i just switched those two and I get x equals 9 over 2 and then we can or actually this still to the third and then i can say c because that's that value that i'm finding is the third root of 9 over 2. now we can simplify that if you want um and if you need to need help doing that you can ask but just for the uh, speedy just for speed sake I'm going to put my box around that and move on to the next example all right my next example and again this is number 62 and it's a um, it's a it's an application problem and you may want to read this but I'm going to read it to you it says the velocity V of the flow of blood at a distance R from the center of the axis of an artery of radius capital R is given as V equals K times uh, capital R squared minus little r squared, where K is the constant of proportionality. Find the average rate of flow of blood used along the radius of the artery. Use zero and capital R as limits of integration. So think of it this way. If you've got a, uh, a, a an artery and it's circular and it has radius capital R, the blood that's flowing along the edge because it touches the edge and the edge has some friction on it, slows it down, is actually going slower than the blood that's in the middle that doesn't have nearly as much friction, uh, the sides moving on it or acting on it. And so what they're saying is that it moves faster on the inside than it does on the outside. And they want to know what the average rate of blood flow, regardless of where it is along this radius, is. So I've got a velocity equation. And so K, they tell us it's a constant of proportionality. Let's do it right there. K is the constant of proportionality. P R O P. And then capital R, that's a constant. Because it's the radius of the artery. The only thing that changes is this little r. And so what this equation does, it says, given some radius, it tells you how fast that blood, that, or that um, cell of blood is traveling through the ar artery, depending on where it is. So they want to find out what the average value of that is. Well, we can do that. That's not a problem. That average value They said that they want that it to be from zero, right in the middle, all the way to R on the edge. That would be capital R minus zero. The integral from zero to capital R. And then it's just capital R squared minus R squared d little r. Now, our little r is our only variable. Capital R is set. It's whatever that uh, radius is. And so we can do this integral. And... Oops, I almost forgot a K. That would have been a mess. Okay, let's let's simplify here. I can bring the K out, and R minus 0 is just R. So I can have K over R, and then the integral from 0 to K of capital R squared minus R squared. And this is all d 
dr. And so both of these two terms, I can apply the simple power rule tool to. So I have k over r, capital R that is. And then this integral here, since it's a constant, the integral of a constant with respect to a variable is going to be that constant left alone times r, times the variable. And then this one is just a regular simple power rule. It'll end up being one third r to the third evaluated from zero to capital R. And I screwed up already. I'm sure I said it right, but wrote it wrong. We said that our upper limit of integration was r, not k. Apologize. And it has to be because we put r there. And so just change those k's to r's and we'll move on. So haven't done anything wrong yet, which is good. So I'm going to leave my K over R on the outside here, and then I'm going to plug in capital R. So I'll get R squared times capital R minus one third capital R now to the third, because I'm plugging it in, minus R squared times zero minus one third times zero to the third. And so this all cancels out. And k over r, and then this will be r to the third minus one third r to the third. And so one minus one third is two thirds. I get an, uh, let's do it one more, we'll do one more. I get k over um, r times, and it'll be two thirds r to the third. One of those r's cancel out, and I get two k r squared all over three. So my average velocity. I think I spelled that right. My average velocity is going to be dependent upon whatever the constant of proportionality is and the radius of the circle. And so the average velocity, any particular um, cell of blood that's going through there will have a average velocity of this expression if you know what k is and you know what r is or how, how long the radius of the blood vessel is. And so the smaller this r is, this, I guess I'm um, I'm assuming the slower it's going to it's going to travel, or at least the the average velocity will travel. Okay, last one. So this one is in the book. It's I think it's number 88 in the section, but it asks us to find the first derivative of capital F of x, given that capital F of x is defined as the definite integral from negative x to positive x of t to the third dt. Now there's a number of different ways that you could do this. But we've been doing integration, and let's, so let's do the definite integral of this using negative x as the upper bound and uh, positive x as the lower bound. So doing this integration, it'll be t to the 3 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 evaluated from negative x to positive x, which is the same as t to the fourth over four, again, evaluated from negative x to positive x, which would be, let's see here, it'll be x to the fourth over four minus negative x to the fourth all over four, which is equal to zero. Okay, well, that makes this easy because the first derivative of zero, oops, excuse me, the first derivative of x that's equal, or the first derivative of 0 is always 0. Now, that was kind of the easy way around it, but let's say you ended up with a function. That would have been OK, too. All we would have needed to do is take the first derivative of that, whatever that might be. So let's just say, and let's use red as a for instance, I got, it, I got x squared or x to the fourth when I did it. Then this would just be 2x, just again, just as a for instance, not necessarily what we got for this particular problem. So let's erase that and see how we go. All right, that's it there, folks. So... Today's super Star Wars fun fact of the day. What was the name of George Lucas' original draft of Star Wars in 1974? Well, it was The Adventures of Luke Starkiller, as taken from the Journal of the Wills, Saga 1, The Star Wars. I think that shortened it up to the last two words, made it a little bit less of a mouthful and a much better, more iconic title. 
Well, that's all I got for you guys today. Uh, if you have any questions, please make sure you bring them to class. I'll see you in class. Have a good one. Bye.